example of more how Maynards contributed to the war effort and how the war shaped their lives long after the guns fell silent. Ashley, thank you. everyone for coming. I think this is the first time I've ever had like a standing room only crowd. <laughs> so I feel really loved today. Um, and I'm really excited to talk to you all about uh, this topic. I am a Mainer. I went to Gettysburg College. Uh, so I am very immersed in the Civil War. It's uh, one of my favorite topics to talk about. And when I was putting this talk together, uh, I had a really difficult time doing it. I'm sure all historians gripe about this, but I was like, there's so much I want to talk about, and I only have so little time to do it. Um, but what I decided to do is, what I found in researching this talk is that a lot of Civil War history is deeply enmeshed with Maine history. Uh, so what I'm going to do today is try to talk about Maine history and show how it illuminates some larger trends of both the coming of the Civil War the Civil War itself, and then also uh, the consequences and the legacy of the Civil War during Reconstruction. So, as I said, even with um, the coming of the war, Maine's history is deeply rooted uh, in the, the Civil War era. So in this top left corner, I'm sure I don't need to tell you guys this, uh, but the uh, origins of the state of Maine are a product of the Civil War and the many compromises that lead to uh, the Civil War eventually. So in the left corner here, that is a, a snippet of a newspaper announcing the passage of the Missouri Compromise in 1820. Um, this is when Maine becomes a state, and it becomes a state because Missouri also wants to become a state at the time, and Missouri allows slavery. Uh, and at the time, there was this delicate balance of power uh, that the, the Senate was trying to, to maintain between free states, so states that don't allow slavery, uh, and states that do allow slavery. So in order to offset Missouri coming in as a slave state, Maine comes into the Union as a free state. So from its very inception, uh, Maine is very much involved in the coming of the Civil War itself. Uh, as you continue through the 19th century, there are Mainers who are involved in <coughs> exacerbating the sectional tensions over slavery uh, that arise as the century continues. So this guy over in the left-hand corner, um, some of you might know him, his name's Elijah Lovejoy, uh, and he was born in Maine. Uh, he was born in Albion, Maine. He was the son of a Congregationalist preacher, and he attended Waterville College, which is better known now as Colby College. But he decides that he wants to seek his fortune elsewhere, like a lot of young Mainers are doing today, too. Uh, so he leaves the state, he heads out west, and he decides to settle in uh, Missouri. And so while he's in Missouri, he starts to publish this religious newspaper, uh, it's fairly moderate on the issue of slavery. He's definitely not a pro-slavery supporter. It's pretty moderate. Uh, but as sectional tensions continue to rise during the, the 19th century, and as the abolitionist movement gains steam um, and popularity, uh, I guess Southerners become increasingly defensive about any attacks on slavery. And so people in Missouri, they start to resent Elijah Lovejoy. Uh, they end up breaking into his newspaper office. They destroy his printing press. And Elijah Lovejoy says, all right, I guess I'm not welcome here anymore. I'm going to scoot up to Illinois instead, and I'll publish my newspaper there. So he goes to Illinois. He thinks he's safe there. He's still publishing his newspaper. Uh, it starts to get more, um, starts to attack slavery a bit more. Of course, after he has pro-slavery mobs breaking up his printing press, you can tell he's a little bit angry about that and how they're trying to stifle the freedom of the press. Um, his printing press is again destroyed in Illinois, in Illinois by a pro-slavery mob. He gets another one. He tries to install it in his office. Another pro-slavery mob comes. 
and they actually set his office on fire, they set the printing press on fire, and while he's trying to extinguish the flames, uh, this mob shoots him and he's murdered uh, as a result of speaking out against slavery. And this is national news, there's a huge outcry against his death, uh, John Quincy Adams, former president of the United States, he called Lovejoy, quote, the first American martyr to the freedom of the press and the freedom of the slave. Um, but he's not the last Mainer who's going to play their part in, um, unint well, not unintentionally, but fanning the flames of, of this sectionalism that's developing in the 19th century. Of course, you're all familiar with Harriet Beecher Stowe uh, and her publication of Uncle Tom's Cabin. Of course, she's from, from Brunswick, Maine. Um, her book is hugely popular for um, depicting slavery in a very um, harsh light that shows just the, the destruction of slavery for, for families. Uh, the book is hugely successful. It sells 300,000 copies in its first year alone. Um, and it's in response to the passage of the Fugitive Slave Act in 1850. So the Fugitive Slave Act is part of one of these other compromises that's happening um, in order to try to stave off the Civil War and kind of kick the can down the road a little bit further. Uh, and the Fugitive Slave Act is really unpopular in the North because it basically said anyone in the North who is caught assisting a runaway slave uh, they can be fined, they can be put in jail, and if a sheriff or a federal official asks a regular citizen to um, help in returning a fugitive slave to the South, they have to do so. So even, they're more, even if they're morally opposed to it, they actually have to help out anyways, or they can face jail time or a pretty harsh fine. Um, so, a lot of Northerners, this makes them really mad, and you get responses like Uncle Tom's Cabin uh, to that. Other people, they still help out anyways. Uh, so in this middle photo here of these two people, um, this is Ellen and William Kraft. They were fugitive slaves. Uh, they were from Georgia, and Ellen comes up with this really ingenious idea to uh, disguise herself as a slave owner, so she had a pretty fair complexion, uh, and so she passes herself off as being a slave owner and has William be her slave, and they actually get on a train and a steamer, and they travel like out in the open uh, as a slave master and a slave. They make their way to Philadelphia, uh, where they are lauded by abolitionist um, circles for their ingenious escape plan. And this is in 1848, uh, but with the passage of the Fugitive Slave Act, people like Ellen and William Kraft become targets for slave catchers. Uh, and they were very public about the way that they had escaped slavery. Uh, so the Crafts, they actually make their way up to Portland through the Underground Railroad. Uh, and then an anti-slavery society in Portland actually helps them to get passage over to Europe, where they stay for the next two decades. They don't come back until two decades later, so long after the Civil War is over. I wanted to make sure things had died down, I guess. Uh, and then finally, in terms of the coming of the Civil War, that guy on the far right is Hannibal Hamlin, uh, the Vice President of the United States for Abraham Lincoln during his first uh, term in office, born in Paris, Maine. Uh, so he really has kind of a, a front row seat to uh, the secession crisis and to the beginnings of the Civil War. Although he's not all that close with Lincoln, he doesn't really have too much of a, an influence on, on Lincoln. He's not invited to like cabinet meetings or anything else. Uh, but you can say he was vice president, so we have that going for us. So. Good for you, <laughs> Hannibal. So uh, let's get to this, the actual Civil War. Uh, when South Carolina secedes from the Union in December of 1860, Mainers 
they immediately rise to action. Uh, so the Lewiston Daily Journal noted that in that city, quote, Central Hall was the scene of a most enthusiastic gathering on Saturday evening last to take into consideration the existing affairs of the nation. Every available spot in the hall was filled and the interest felt in the proceedings surpassed anything we ever witnessed. <coughs> and in Portland, the Eastern Argus reported that our city is alive with enthusiasm. Never before has such a time been known. Citizens of all classes and occupations are aroused to the importance of the crisis and businesses and everything else gives way to the feelings inspired. <coughs> Nothing else is talked of in streets or in families, but the war and the latest intelligence is looked for with the utmost anxiety. Uh, and here you see a broadside from right after uh, the bombardment of Fort Sumter, which marks the beginning of hostilities um, of the Civil War. And you see, this is from Portland. It's basically a call to arms uh, for people to gather to figure out what their next steps are going to be uh, for the coming, the coming war. And they're hearkening back to uh, the American Revolution here and saying that this is just as um, important a time uh, as 1776 was. This is going to be, in some ways, like a, a second coming of independence for the United States. In Auburn, there are also men who rallied to the cause very quickly. Um, there were some veterans there that drew up this document that basically pledged their services to the Union. Uh, they wrote, quote, the undersigned old patriots of Auburn freely offer our services in the cause of the Union and respectfully offer our services as volunteer company. Uh, and on that document, Amos Kyle, who was a 69-year-old veteran of the War of 1812, was the first one to sign up. Uh, so you get a sense of just how dire the situation was uh, and how willing men were to, to go to war to save the Union. So what did war look like? What is Maine's contribution? Uh, there are over 70,000 Maine men who serve in the Union Army between 1861 and 1865. And that was over half of Maine's men who were between the ages of 18 and 35. So this is a massive contribution that the state is making to the war effort. And of that number, uh, 9,400 men are going to die during the war, and 5,820 other men are going to be discharged due to injury or illness. So you have about 15,000 families who are going to be affected by this war in some way, uh, which is a really dramatic number if you think about it. But it's not just Maine men uh, who go to war. Women are also mobilized when the war breaks out. Uh, and they do a whole host of things to support the war effort. So uh, they have no, they have no, they have uh, knitting circles and sewing circles where they're making blankets and quilts and socks and hats for Union soldiers. Um, some of them join things like the United States Christian Commission or the United States Sanitary Commission where they're shipping Bibles and supplies to Union troops. Um, but one of the favorite things that I found was some women who made donuts <laughs> during the war. Um, so this is actually, this news came down to Baltimore. That's how exciting it was. Um, so there was a feast of donuts in 1861. Uh, the ladies of Augusta distributed over 50 bushels of donuts to the 3rd Volunteer Regiment of Maine previous to their departure for the seat of war. Procession of ladies headed by music passed between double lines of troops who presented arms and were afterwards drawn up in hollow square to receive the welcome donation. <laughs> uh, never before was seen such an aggregate of donuts since the world began. <laughs> Lead with that, not Hannibal Hamlet. <laughs> uh, 
The circumambient air was redolent of donuts. Every breeze sighed donuts. Everybody talked of donuts. The display of donuts beggared description. There was the molasses donut and the sugar donut, the long donut and the short donut, the round donut and the square donut, the rectangular donut and the triangular donut, the single, the single twisted donut, the double twisted donut, the light wrist donut, and the hard kneaded donut, the straight solid donut, and the circular donut with a hole in the center. <laughs> there were donuts of all imaginary kinds, qualities, shapes, and dimensions. It was emphatically a feast of donuts, if not a flow of soul. <laughs> um, and there was another, a Portland paper, that also wrote about women giving out donuts to soldiers, and they said if the soldiers were as aggressive with the Confederacy in their fighting as they were with how they attacked eating the donuts. The war would be over. Um, so, mayors love their donuts. Uh, of course, probably the better known story are uh, the women who serve as nurses. And it's hard to, to know just how many uh, women from Maine were nurses. The, the records are not very good uh, when it comes to, to figuring out how many there were. Uh, but one historian says that there were at least 20,000 nurses who served the Union um, nationally. So take that for what it's worth. Uh, but in Maine, women did rush to fill positions as, as hospital nurses and army nurses. And a lot of them actually got turned away because they just didn't have the space to, um, to accept all of them. And so one woman who was really looking for a job as a nurse was Mrs. Van Horn. Uh, she wrote to the governor of Maine at the time, Governor Washburn, and she had this to say to him. She said, I have been informed on good authority that you have decided to appoint assistant female nurses in our camp hospitals. I have healthy nerves, strong back, never fainted in all my life, never had a fever, and am not subject to them, can endure a great deal of fatigue without complaint, have studied medicine, and am called a good nurse by those who ought to be judges. And more than all, Your Excellency, my whole heart and soul and life is in this work. And then she kind of threatens him. She says, I will go with the help of heaven if I deny my sex by adopting your dress and begging my way to the sick and wounded and dying of our brave volunteers. God help me. So basically she's saying, if you don't allow me to go, I'm going to dress up as a man. I'm going to make my way there somehow. And I'm going to get to those soldiers to help them. Uh, and there are some reports of women dressing up as men and passing as men in order to serve in the Union Army. Um, there's one rumor from, I think, the 16th Maine. There's a guy who writes a regimental history and says that uh, there was a rumor that there was a woman from Maine who was serving in that regiment. Um, but there's no known cases for sure. Um, and it's also not known if Mrs. Van Horn does get into uh, the Army as a nurse. Um, there's no record of her, but there are other women who do join. Uh, one of those women is Isabella Fogg. Isabella Fogg was from Callis, uh, and she's really interesting because she's representative of a lesser known strand of Civil War nurses. Some of you might be familiar with Dorothea Dix. She is also uh, one of those women who is uh, a famous Mainer. Um, she becomes the superintendent of nurses for the Union Army. Uh, she's very high up uh, in her leadership role there. But you have other women like Isabella Fogg and Harriet Eaton, who we'll talk about in a minute, who they are much more interested in uh, organizing local organizations uh, to help Maine troops in particular. So they're not on the federal bureaucratic level of working with like the United States Sanitary Commission. Um, Isabel Fogg, Isabella Fogg, she is responsible for the creation of the Maine Sanitary Commission, uh, which is an arm of the United States Sanitary Commission. And she is very good at uh, lobbying local officials in Maine to get more support. So she writes this letter to the mayor of Portland about what she sees uh, when she's working with the Union Army early on. And she says, here the sick are in fearful condition, in every old house and church and hundreds on the ground. You no doubt think your ladies in Washington are doing a great work, 
But I can assure you, if they were here, they would find the stern reality of want, privation, and extreme suffering. And so, partly in response to this letter, the mayor of Portland actually uh, works with the Free Street Church of Portland to create the Main Camp Hospital Association, uh, which is going to be in charge of bringing in supplies uh, to send down to uh, the, the troops, to main regiments. And Isabella Fogg is really on the front lines of distributing uh, those resources down at the battlefront. And she's not alone. She's working with this woman, Harriet Eaton, uh, who was from Portland. She was in her mid-40s when she decides to join the war effort. She was a widower. Her husband had actually been the minister of the Free Baptist um, Church. And she also has three children. Uh, at least one of them is serving in the Union Army, and that's part of the reason why she decides to go to war, is she wants to help other men uh, who are at war like her son and take care of them. Uh, so she takes her other children, she leaves them with a friend in Gorham, and she goes down to the, the front lines uh, to serve with the Union Army. And so while she also, she hoped to care for her sons, uh, the other thing that she was interested in is converting soldiers while she was there. She kind of would have had, uh, in some ways, a captive audience of <laughs> nursing men back to health. And so she thought uh, that she could, she could maybe convert a few soldiers while she was there. Uh, but she's not, very con she's not very successful at this. She writes in her journal at one point, one day she's really excited uh, because she very easily distributed all of these religious tracts to the soldiers. And then she writes a little bit later uh, that she found them later using the tracts to light their pipes. So it wasn't, it wasn't all that successful. Uh, but nevertheless, she has a really remarkable experience as uh, a Civil War nurse. She rubs elbows with people like Joshua Chamberlain. Uh, it wouldn't be a lecture about the Civil War if I didn't name drop, drop up Joshua Chamberlain at least once. Um, she rubs elbows with him, uh, with Adelbert Ames, who I'll talk about in a second, uh, with Clara Barton. They're both at Fredericksburg at the same time, nursing soldiers together. Uh, Clara Barton, of course, goes on to found the Red Cross later on. Um, so in her initial service, she's working as a roving nurse, which basically means she's not attached to any one regiment. She's not stationed at a hospital. She's basically just following the Union Army around and catering to uh, main regiments and trying to get them supplies. Uh, she becomes sick in May 1863, and she has to go home. Uh, but once she's recovered, she goes back to work and she works at City Point Hospital in Virginia for the rest of the war. Um, so she's very active in the war. And this wasn't easy work by any means. Uh, this is from her journal on uh, probably one of the first battles that she witnessed during the war. This is the Battle of Fredericksburg. And so she writes, an awful day, the battle began in the morning and has continued all day. We drove over to the Lacey House about half mile from the battlefield where they were bringing the dying and where lay the dead. It was my first experience and an awful one it was, but I find my nerves strong to endure where I can be of service. Two shells struck the house while we were in it and the noise of the musketry and cannons, cannons roar and flash was perfectly terrific. And so uh, Eaton's experience during the Civil War is representative of this larger trend for women during the Civil War, where they take on uh, a lot of additional responsibilities outside of the household. Um, and so it's really a watershed women for a watershed moment for women in a lot of ways. Prior to the Civil War, of course, women were supposed to remain in the domestic sphere. Uh, they're supposed to stay in the household. They're supposed to be chaste and pure um, and dependent on their men for their livelihood. Of course, the war upsets a lot of those social relations, and women are forced outside of the household into these new roles, uh, and dangerous ones at that. Um, obviously seen here, she could have been killed by that, that cannon fire. Um, so she's risking her life. There are other uh, Mainers who also risk their life during the Civil War. Uh, 
probably another story that you're not all that interested, not all that interested, not all that familiar with. I hope you're interested. I wouldn't be doing my job. Um, <laughs> Uh, is the story of John Nichols, who we would say is from away. Uh, so Nichols was born into slavery in North Carolina. When he was young, his mother died. His father is sold away from the plantation. He lives on an adjoining plantation, so they're not super far away from each other. But basically, where he's living, he doesn't really have any relatives um, to raise him. And he gives an interview to the Lewiston Journal Illustrated Magazine in 1921. This is a really fascinating journal. They publish all kinds of interviews and like personal or public interest stories about the Civil War uh, in the early 20th century. Um, and Nichols is one of the guys that they, um, they interview. And so in talking about slavery, he says, I can remember back to a few years before the war, but when father was sold, I began to realize that slavery was the greatest curse on God's earth. I was never whipped, but once severely, and I still got a scar on my side where the lash fell. The boss of the farm did it and used a hickory stick. They also used rawhide whips, and these were even worse when laid on the bare flesh. Uh, so, it's growing up in North Carolina, Obviously, it's a difficult life. Uh, he's beaten, his family is gone. Um, and he learns about the war in 1862. And when that happens, he says, quote, news came to us now and then of the great armies less than 50 miles away. And that only gave us courage to make the attempt. And so him, and he says it was around 300 other slaves which seems like a lot, uh, so I don't, I don't think it was that many, but uh, he says that 300 other slaves decide that they're going to escape to Union lines and to freedom. And he says that his father is actually the one that's organizing and planning the whole thing. So what they do is uh, they get um, uh, a free black man who knows his way through what was known as the Dismal Swamp. Um, to, to take them to Union Lines as their guide. And so they pay him. And on the appointed day that they're supposed to head into the Dismal Swamp to escape, uh, it turns out that this guy had actually betrayed them and taken their money and he had told their owners what their plan was. Uh, so they show up and there are these slave catchers who are ready to round them up. Uh, they end up capturing a majority of the slaves who are trying to flee, except for Nichols says there are seven of them who are able to escape into the swamp and run away. Uh, and so Nichols is one of them, and also his father is the other. But while they're in the swamp fleeing in this chaos, uh, Nichols loses his father, and he never sees him again. He doesn't think that he made it out of the swamp. Uh, and so for the rest of his life, it's kind of, it's this question of, of what happened to his father, which is really um, terrible. But he does eventually make it through the swamp on his own. Um, his interview talks a lot about how while he was in the swamp, I think he was there for maybe like four days to a week, something like that. Uh, he talks about how he got to know the snakes really well uh, and the difference between the good snakes and the bad snakes. Um, but he eventually makes his way out, he finds the, the Union Army, uh, they take him in, and he serves for the rest of the war as a mule driver, and he also unloads ammunition for uh, the Union Army. And in talking about his service, he says that that gave us two great advantages. It first gave us security from our former masters, and it also gave us plenty to eat and better than we had ever had in our old slave cabins. Um, so for some enslaved African Americans, the Civil War presents uh, this amazing opportunity for them if they are, they are brave enough and if they have the opportunity to flee to freedom and actually <coughs> gain freedom for themselves. Um, and this is a story that is very common during the Civil War. Um, Starting in 1861, enslaved people seem to know that this is a war for freedom before um, a lot of people fighting the war even know it's a war for freedom. So they start to show up at Union lines asking 
um, to, to serve the Union war effort in order to escape from slavery. Uh, and of course, the numbers of enslaved people who flow into Union lines um, increases dramatically after the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, uh, when the war really does become this war for ending slavery. Um, and these are, are men who were working in contraband camps, uh, which were camps that were established for uh, refugee slaves uh, to work in behind Union lines to support the war effort. Um, so, but I said that this was a talk about Mainers, and so far all we know about John Nichols is that he is from North Carolina. Uh, but John Nichols does make his way up to Maine. He ends up settling in Lewiston. Uh, the Surgeon General for Maine, Dr. Alonzo Garcelon, he comes up with this program of sending freed slaves um, up north after the war to work on farms and work as um, domestic helpers in Maine homes. And so Nichols is one of these men who moves to Lewiston and he works cleaning homes and doing other odd jobs and he seems to have a really great life once he comes up to Lewiston. He marries Maggie Brooks who was a native of Canada. Um, they have at least 10 children. And in the interview that he gives to the Lewiston Journal that I mentioned, um, thinking about his experiences, he said, I thank God that my children were born in freedom. Of all the horrors of slavery, the selling of children from their parents was the worst. Do you wonder that I love the North with its glorious air of freedom? I can never be too thankful that I was brought to Lewiston. Um, so, uh, uh, Mayner from away. Uh, who, who comes to Maine as a result of his experiences during the Civil War. Uh, and his story is related to the next guy I'm going to talk about, who's probably a little bit more well-known to you. Um, but his name is Oliver Otis Howard, and he runs the Freedmen's Bureau after the Civil War, which is basically um, an institution that was supposed to attempt to help slaves in this transition from freedom to slavery after the war. Um, but I'm getting, my head, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, so who is Howard? He's born in 1830 in Leeds, Maine, as a lot of uh, well-known Civil War figures from Maine did. He graduated from Bowdoin College, and then he went on to West Point. Um, and Following uh, his time in West Point, as he's serving in the Army, he experiences this very profound conversion uh, to Christianity. And he becomes known as, his nickname is the Christian, Christian General, because of, of how pious he is. Um, and during the Civil War, he really distinguishes himself. Uh, he rises through the ranks from being a brigade commander at Fair Oaks, at Fair Oaks, he actually, he's wounded. He ends up losing his arm um, at Fair Oaks. But he's back on the job, and he is a corps commander at Ch Chancellorsville. Um, that's not such a great experience for him. He's uh, famously the, the commander that gets flanked um, by Lee and Stonewall Jackson. And basically, they lose the Battle of Chancellorsville. And a lot of people blame Howard and his corps unfairly for that. Um, but he redeems himself at the Battle of Gettysburg. He's instrumental there at maintaining uh, the position on Cemetery Ridge on the first day of the battle. Um, and after that, he finishes out the war in the West under the command of William Tecumseh Sherman. Uh, and Sherman has nothing but good things to say about Howard and his leadership uh, in the war. But what I want to talk about with you is his experiences after the war, which are probably less well known. Um, so because he was able to rise above a lot of partisan politics that could um, grip the army, um, Howard is appointed to be the commissioner of the Freedmen's Bureau. And the Freedmen's Bureau has a really monumental task that it is faced with. Uh, it's basically supposed to oversee the transition from slavery to freedom for the formerly enslaved in the South. 
right? So uh, this is a monumental undertaking. So basically, uh, bureau agents were assigned to feed, clothe, provide medical care uh, for former slaves. Um, they were supposed to help them build schools, churches, community organizations. They were also there to supervise the labor contracts that uh, former masters and former slaves were entering into to make sure that former masters uh, weren't trying to basically submit them into another form of slavery. They wanted to make sure the labor contracts were fair. Uh, and the Freedmen's Bureau is also initially adjudicating uh, cases of murder and violence against enslaved, formerly enslaved people. Um, and so Howard is overseeing all of this. Um, <clears throat> and in this work, here's what Howard has to say about what he thought he was doing as part of the Bureau. He said, the government has solemnly promised to them, the freedmen, their freedom and the fruits of freedom. It will keep that promise. I think that all we have to do it is to aim at absolute justice to blacks and whites, watching the signs of the times and keeping a steady reign. I believe that when God sent us forth to liberate this oppressed race, he did not mean that they should be wholly engulfed. He intended that they should be free and free to some purpose. If we attempt to re-enslave them or to bind any heavy burdens upon them, he will chasten us again and again. Um, so Howard really sees himself and the Freedmen's Bureau as being a fulfillment of what the Civil War was fought over, uh, which is no small task for him to undertake uh, and to see that God's will is ba basically accomplished um, during Reconstruction. But he's going to have a lot of obstacles uh, in fulfilling this mission. For one, Andrew Johnson, who becomes president when Abraham Lincoln is assassinated, uh, he absolutely hates the Freedmen's Bureau. Uh, he vetoes bills to renew the Bureau multiple times, like twice. He, he vetoes the bill to, to renew them. Uh, and the Bureau, throughout its duration, it's largely understaffed. They don't have enough agents to do all of that work, uh, and they don't have enough funds to, to do everything that they want to do. And public opinion on the Bureau is uh, it can be hostile. So this is a broadside um, depicting the Bureau in a pretty harsh light and basically um, arguing that the assistance that the federal government was giving to free people uh, was making them lazy and that these were basically just handouts uh, that free people were getting. But nevertheless, the Bureau is really uh, it is successful in assisting former slaves in achieving their goals of freedom. Uh, so here are just a few images of what the Freedmen's Bureau was able to do. Um, in this top corner, you see a Freedmen's Bureau agent basically breaking up a dispute between freed slaves and uh, some very angry white Southerners. Uh, down here is a Freedmen's School that was open and operated um, by Northern Volunteers with the help of the Freedmen's Bureau. And education is really one of the central goals for, for free slaves uh, after the war is over. Not only because they thought that that could be a means of, of bettering themselves and getting better jobs, but also for religious reasons. Uh, they wanted to be able to read the Bible for themselves and not hear it from their former masters who had a very different version of, sla of Christianity that defended slavery. Uh, so they wanted to hear the word of, of God for themselves and read it for themselves. And on the, the right, uh, you can see the Freedmen's Bureau agent on the right sitting down with a former master uh, and another white guy as former slaves are coming in to ask the, the Bureau for help or to complain <coughs> about their employers not giving them wages or something like that. Um, so Howard, by all accounts, historians generally agree that with uh, the staff that he had, the funds that he had, and with a lot of public opinion against the Bureau, uh, he did a pretty good job with what he had. Um, but 
the Bureau does end in 1870, 1874, it's basically defunct. Um, and so what he does in the meantime is he goes on to found Howard University, uh, the historically black college in Washington, D.C. Um, and he is the president of Howard University from, let's say it's like 1869 to 1874. Uh, this is the house that he lived in on Howard University's campus. And of course, they named the university after him. That's how it got the name Howard University. Uh, and following his stint as president of the university and being the commissioner of the Freedmen's Bureau, he sent out west and he participates in the Indian Wars and he famously uh, is part of um, the attacks that subdue Chief Joseph and the Nez Pierce um, out west in 1874. He has a brief stint as the superintendent of West Point for about a year or two uh, and then he ends up moving to Vermont and he passes away there in 1908. So he doesn't come back to Maine and live in Maine, but he does come back for Bowdoin reunions. There are some photos of uh, Joshua Chamberlain and Oliver Otis Howard together during graduation. So, um, cool. <laughs> the other guy that I wanted to tell you about, who also has a lot of uh, a lot of doings with Reconstruction, is Adelbert Ames, who was born in Rockland in 1835. Uh, he also attends West Point and during the Civil War he rises through the ranks from being a second lieutenant. He is the regimental commander of the 20th Maine before he hands over the reins to Joshua Chamberlain. Um, and he ends up going on to become a breveted major general by the end of the war. Um, and one of his aides de camp who wrote about him had this to say uh, about his leadership style and what he was he was like he said everyone who rode with him in battle soon discovered that Ames never hesitated to take desperate chances under fire although he never permitted anything to stand in his way and never asked men to go where he would not go himself still his manner was very cool calm and gentlemanly under the heaviest fire, when men and officers were being stricken down around him, he would sit on his horse and quietly give his orders, which were invariably communicated in the most polite way and generally in the form of a request. I often thought when I saw him under fire that if one of his legs had been carried away by a round shot, he would merely turn to some officer or soldier nearby and quietly say, will you kindly assist me from my horse? <laughs> it's like the very definition of Yankee stoicism. Um, and when he first joins the army, uh, he is known as being a taskmaster on his men. Uh, he drills them and he's very hard on them. And some of the, the members of his staff are actually concerned that when his men get into battle, at the first chance they're going to shoot him just because of how hard he is on them. Um, but for this reason, uh, they actually come to really love him because he's willing to put himself into these positions with his men. He doesn't send them alone. Uh, and famously, I think at the Battle of Fredericksburg, as they're storming uh, Mary's Heights, uh, across this open field, he basically steps out in front of his men to lead them uh, in the charge. And so uh, he, he was definitely an example of, of leadership and, and putting his men first. And so when the Civil War uh, ends for Ames, he is still in the Army. He wasn't a volunteer. He's part of the regular Army. Uh, and so he is shipped south to South Carolina. And he has a brief stint there. He's there for a couple of years. And as a result of Reconstruction politics at the, summit, at the time, he eventually makes his way down to Mississippi. Um, so for the first two years after the Civil War is over, uh, the South is basically under a Reconstruction plan that was organized by President Johnson. Uh, Johnson's Reconstruction Plan is very lenient on the South. It basically allowed Southerners to um, 
say, sorry, I fought in the war. And basically, they were brought back into the Union for the most part. Uh, and so you have a lot of former Confederate officials and generals and politicians who uh, are immediately elected back into like state office, which people in the North, uh, they question because they just fought the Civil War and now the same leaders who had brought the South into the war are back in power. Uh, and they don't think that's right. And on top of that, Southern states start, start to pass what's known as black codes, which are basically um, a series of laws that are meant to curtail the freedom of freed slaves and basically force them back into a position uh, that's not quite slavery, but it's basically slavery by another name. Uh, and again, for, nor for Northerners, they see this as being really a gross uh, insult based on what they had just accomplished with the Civil War. Uh, so there's a lot of political movement uh, in Washington. Radical Republicans come very close to impeaching Andrew Johnson. Uh, they aren't able to do so, but Republicans in, in uh, the legislature, they do gain enough power that they can veto um, or override any of Andrew Johnson's vetoes, and they're basically in power. And as a result of that, they're able to pass this new reconstruction plan um, which divided the South into five military districts, which put the South under military control, basically. And so that's how uh, Ames ends up in Mississippi. He's under, he's basically in command of the fourth military district. And he appoints himself provisional governor of Mississippi in 1868, which uh, he, you probably know Mississippians there were not very happy that this guy from the north basically just came in and took over power uh, in Mississippi and installed himself as governor. Um, but while he is governor of Mississippi, he oversees some really dramatic changes in Mississippi society, politics, and economics. Uh, that photo on the right uh, is a celebration of the passing of the 15th Amendment in 1870, which gave African Americans or African American men the right to vote. <clears throat> but it's also a celebration of all of the advances that African Americans are able to make with freedom. Uh, so they go to school, they get married, uh, they serve in the state and the national legislature. Uh, they're serving in churches. They erect their own churches. They serve in the military. Uh, they're able to create their own fraternal institutions and organizations. Uh, so this is a, a massive flowering of African-American political and social life um, during the 18, late 1860s and 1870s. And Ames is part of that. He actually appoints some of uh, the first black officials to Mississippi positions of power, um, including, I think, the first black sheriff is appointed uh, by Adelbert Ames. Um, here's a very famous image um, of African American men voting in their first elections um, in 1867, maybe 1868 for this one. Uh, but African American voters become one of uh, Ames's and the Republicans' <coughs> bases, and how they're able to get uh, so much power in the South during Reconstruction. Uh, so Ames cobbles together a biracial coalition of white Republicans and black Republicans in Mississippi uh, that enable him to rise to pretty impressive ranks uh, in Mississippi. Um, <coughs> he's elected as senator so he represents the state of Mississippi as a senator between 1870 and 1874. Uh, and this is a cartoon not of Ames, but he uh, serves alongside the first black senator to be elected um, ever in the United States. That guy on the right, that's Hiram Rebels. Uh, he's one of two senators, black senators, that will be elected. Um, the next one is Blanche K. Bruce. He's a little bit later than Ames. Uh, but Ames serves with Hiram Revels, and Revels actually took Jefferson Davis, the former president of the Confederacy, 
who had been a senator from Mississippi, uh, rebels actually, he takes his seat in the Senate, which is a really kind of remarkable thing to think about. Uh, following Ames's stint in the Senate, he's popular enough among African Americans and Republicans in Mississippi that he is elected governor. He doesn't appoint himself provisional governor this time. Uh, he's actually elected. And Ames serves as governor of Mississippi from 1874 to 1876. Uh, but by this point, white Democrats in the South are getting fed up with Republican rule. Um, they are sick of federal intervention in their affairs. Uh, and they embark on this plan, what's known as the Mississippi Plan. Um, and so you see newspapers start to come out like this one, uh, which are using not very coded language about what they think should be done to overthrow Republican rule in the South. So the Vicksburg Herald had this to say. They said, much as we deplore bloodshed and much as we lament violence, we believe that every riot will carry a plain lesson to the intelligent electors of Mississippi. To put down this riotous, revengeful feeling, we have just got to put down the Ames ring. Just so long as the Ames power rules Mississippi, just so long will white men be compelled to sleep with guns handy to reach. Uh, so there's threats of violence here from white Democrats being like, if we can't vote out uh, Ames and his people, uh, bloodshed might be what we have to resort to in order to kick them out um, of Mississippi. And this becomes known as the Mississippi Plan. Uh, they basically say that they're going to use violence and intimidation against white Republicans and African Americans in order to stop uh, them from voting in elections and getting into power. And the Westville News put it even more bluntly when they said, quote, vote the Negro down or knock him down. Does not that very thought boil the blood in every vein? Will you still contend that we must not have a white man's party? Away with such false doctrines, we must send and will have a white man's party. We have tried policy long enough. We must organize on the color line, disregarding minor considerations. The white man's party is the only salvation for the state. Show the Negro his place and make him keep it. If we cannot vote him down, we can knock him down, and the result will be the same. Either the white man or Negro will rule this country. They cannot both do it, and it is for the white men to say who the ruler shall be. Let us have a white man's party to rule a white man's country, and to do it like white men. And so something has to be done about him. Uh, and so what they do is they actually form what they call the white man's party, because uh, they couldn't think of a better name for it. That's just what they go for. And it's basically, um, uh, basically a paramilitary group who go around terrorizing African Americans and white Republicans and forcing them uh, not to go to the polls on election day to vote. There's a riot that happens in Vicksburg, Mississippi in 1875, um, where the sheriff is driven out of town. He was an African-American sheriff. They drive him out of town. Uh, there's a riot that occurs where white men murder African-Americans. The numbers, uh, we're not sure how many African-Americans die in that riot. Some reported it was up to 300, which again seems really high. Uh, but Mississippi is a very bloody place in the late 1870s. And Ames is overseeing all of this as governor. And he seems, he feels really powerless in this situation. He calls on uh, President Grant at the time to send in federal troops to try to put down this, these riots. But by that point, Grant is reluctant to do so uh, because he doesn't want to make it seem like the South is being governed by bayonet rule and by federal troops. So he doesn't send troops to help Ames, who is besieged by this point. Uh, and the Mississippi plan works. So this stuff works. African Americans stay home on election day. Uh, white Republicans, they stay home on election day. 
and Democrats are able to take back the House and the Senate in Mississippi in 1876, and they have a majority. And so when that happens, they actually uh, start to institute articles of impeachment against Ames to get him out of the governor's office. Uh, Ames decides that he doesn't want to go through a costly trial, uh, even though the evidence against him for impeachment was very weak. They really didn't have anything on him. Um, he doesn't want to go through the trial, so he makes a deal, his lawyers make a deal, and they say if you drop the charges against Ames, uh, he will resign from office and he'll get out of Mississippi. And so that's what happens. Uh, they. They come to this deal, they appoint a Democratic governor of Mississippi, uh, and the Mississippi plan works, and Mississippi is returned to what they call home rule. Um, Ames, after that, he heads to Minnesota, where his family had a, a flour mill, uh, and then he heads back to Massachusetts, where he opens his own flour mill. Uh, his wife was from Massachusetts. She was the daughter of uh, Benjamin Butler, for any of you who know him, um, Beast Butler, Spoons Butler of New Orleans fame. This is a aside, but uh, during the war, Benjamin Butler was in New Orleans uh, under the occupied, he was occupying New Orleans. And women in the South, they uh, did not take kindly to Union soldiers there. Uh, and so they would empty their um, chamber pots on the heads of passing soldiers, and they refused to like curtsy to them in the streets. Uh, and as a result, Butler passes this really uh, insulting order where he says that any woman who disrespects uh, Union soldiers like that would be treated as a lady of the town. So basically, she would be punished as a prostitute, uh, which Southerners did not take kindly to. And so they call him Beast Butler in the South. Um, but anyway, so Ames, he's married to his daughter. Uh, and uh, so he ends up going back to Massachusetts, living there. He ends up fighting in the Spanish-American War. Um, and then he ends up dying at the ripe old age of 97 wow. in 1933. And he's actually, in 1933, he is the oldest still living, he's the last living general of the Civil War, basically full general, he's the last one. Um, and so I didn't wanna leave this uh, lecture on that somber note uh, I did men, mean to, to mention that Ames always regretted that he wasn't able to do more during his time uh, in Mississippi. And he was really defensive because right after, after Reconstruction ends, uh, people start to say that Republicans in the South were corrupt, they were only out for their own gains, they were embezzling money. Um, and Ames was very quick to always put that kind of talk to rest. And so here's what he had to say about his time uh, in the South. He said, in my time I have known many politicians and office holders, state and national, but nowhere at no time have I met men more honest, more single-minded, or with higher ideals than those of the Republican Party in Mississippi. We were all young, each and every one believed he was doing God's service, and that the final result of his labors would be the elevation of an unhappy class of human beings. Unfortunately, greed, the father of slaves, was too much for us. He who was a slave is now at best a serf. His road to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness seems endless thanks to the attitude of our Christian nation of this day and generation. Yeah, so uh, not the most triumphant ending to, to Reconstruction for Ames. Um, but closer to home, there was reason to hope that things would get better. This was one really cool thing I found when I was uh, researching for this talk. In 1877, when Reconstruction was coming to an end, uh, Frederick Douglass, who you can see, is right there. Uh, he was invited by the first Maine Cavalry to come to their reunion at Old Orchard Beach. Uh, so <laughs> Frederick Douglass is hanging out in Old Orchard Beach in 1877. Um, He's got some and, french fries. 
famous peer prize. Uh, but he had this to say about uh, being received in Maine and being invited by the first Maine Cavalry. Uh, he noted that it was a sign of great progress in race relations that he had enjoyed, quote, a game of croquet with ladies and gentlemen of a different race right out in front of the hotel. <laughs> so there's that at least. Um, so I think I'm over my time, so I'll leave it there. Uh, but thank you for listening to me ramble on. Oh,